Trigonometry is a big subject, and we need to use a lot of trigonometry this year in calculus. So a lot of students might feel anxious because uh, they're not sure whether they remember all of the things they need to know for trigonometry. So the purpose of this video is to give you the list, uh, the short list, six items that I need you to know this year in trigonometry. Number one, the definitions of the sine function and the cosine function. There are two definitions. One uses triangle trigonometry and the other uses the unit circle. Second, I need you to know the ratio relationships among the different trig functions. For example, sine over cosine equals tangent and so on. The third thing you need to, to know is uh, what the sines and cosines of certain special angles are. You should be able to find the sine and cosine without a calculator. The fourth is the Pythagorean identities. There are three. You really only need to know one of them because you could find the other two. Fifth, the angle sum formulas for sine and cosine. And the final thing is you need to understand what the graphs look like for not only the six trigonometric functions, but also the six functions we call inverse or arc trig functions. All right, we'll start with number one. The two definitions, first of all, the triangle trigonometry, we have an opposite and adjacent leg and a hypotenuse. And the mnemonic so katoa, or if you prefer, Oscar had a heap of apples, tells you the definitions of the sine, cosine, and tangent function. So, for example, in this diagram, suppose you want to find the sine of 45 degrees. Well, you know that sine is opposite over hypotenuse, and the uh, opposite is, in this case, 5. So we put 5 in the numerator, and the length of the hypotenuse, in this case, is 5 square root of 2. So we put 5 square root of 2 in the denominator, and we get the simplified answer, the sine of 45 degrees is square root of 2 over 2. Or, if we want to find, say, the cosine of alpha, and then we look at the triangle alpha is in, and cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, the adjacent leg is 4, so 4 goes in the numerator, and the hypotenuse in this case is 5, so 5 goes in the denominator. So the cosine of that angle alpha is 4 fifths. That's how the triangle trigonometry definitions work. They're very good for the angles between 0 and 90 degrees, but if you want to go all the way around the circle, the better definitions are based on the unit circle. So the point on a unit circle at an angle theta are cosine theta at cosine theta and sine theta. The x value is cosine theta, the y value is sine theta. The angle is measured counterclockwise from the positive x-axis. So if you are just looking in the first quadrant, you could draw a triangle and see that this is equivalent to the triangle trigonometry definition. Uh, but this is very helpful as you go around the circle to larger uh, values. So quadrant 1, 2, 3, and 4 are numbered in that order because the angle is measured counterclockwise from the positive x-axis. Number two, the ratio relationships of the six trigonometric functions. Okay, the, the unit circle defines the sine function and the cosine function, um, and you know the sine divided by the cosine is the tangent. You can define the other three trigonometric functions um, in terms of the first three. Uh, each one is paired with a cofunction, where the sine of an angle is the cosine of, of the complement of that angle. And the same thing is true of tangent and cotangent and secant and cosecant. So each function graph has the same shape as its cofunction. And then the other thing to remember is the reciprocals. So the sine theta is the reciprocal of cosecant theta and so on. Reciprocal pairs are connected by blue lines. So here's an example of how you could use it. Sine of theta times secant theta equals tan theta secant theta times cotangent theta equals cosecant theta, cosecant theta times sine of theta equals 1, and if you're asked to simplify secant theta times tan theta, you can't really do that um, because nothing cancels out. So you have to understand how those examples are done. Number three, the sines and cosines of 16 special angles. 
Uh, there's a story that maybe you haven't heard. I'll tell it now. Once a kid was given a test, this test, he had to write down the sines and cosines of, of these angles, and he realized he hadn't done his homework. So after panicking for a few minutes, he gave up. He said, well, I'll just write anything. So he writes down the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then he says, all right, well, for, for the cosine, I'll go in the other direction, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. And then he decides, well, I should make it look more complicated. So he puts a square root over all of the numbers. And then he's just sitting there waiting for the test to be over, and he thinks, boy, I'd be lucky if I even get half credit. So as he's thinking of half, he, he draws uh, over 2 for all of the numbers. And he hands his paper in. When he got back his paper, he was delighted to discover he got everything completely right. Now, these numbers are not simplified. They're not in simplified form. But you just have to remember these five numbers. Zero, one-half, square root of two over two, square root of three over two, and one. If you just remember those five values, you'll, you'll be able to state the sine and cosine of any special angles. Like, for example, these angles, if you divide the right angle into thirds, then you get angles in radians, they're tau over 12, tau over 6, and tau over 4. You might remember these uh, as, uh, you know, it might have been listed as pi over 6, pi over 3, and pi over 2. Um, so these are special angles, and if you just look at the diagram, you can see that, for example, the, the, the x and the y coordinates of tau over 12, uh, you can see that the y coordinate at that point is a half, and the x coordinate is square root of 3 over 2, and that tells you that the sine of tau over 12 is 1 half. And similarly, you could find the sine and cosine of tau over 6. They, they, you know, they're from the same two numbers. Uh, but now the sine of tau over 6 is square root of 3 over 2. Now, the 16 special angles will all have sines and cosines that are made up of these five numbers. So, um, there are, so for example, if you had the cosine of 5 tau over 12, 5 tau, where is 5 tau over 12? It's just tau over 12 short of 6 tau over 12, half of tau. It's just over there. So that angle has a cosine, that's the x component, it's negative, it's big, the answer is negative, square root of 3 over 2. That's what you should be able to do using the unit circle to find sines and cosines of special angles. Number four, the Pythagorean identities. Now, we'll start with the Pythagorean theorem. We've got a right triangle, sides A, B, and C, and the Pythagorean theorem says c squared equals a squared plus b squared, or a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Uh, you could take all of the terms of that and divide by c and get a over c squared plus b over c squared equals 1. Similarly, you could divide every term by b, you could divide every term by a, and you get three uh, less familiar looking statements that still are statements of the Pythagorean theorem. But these six different ratios in these three equations can be written as trigonometric functions of theta. And when you write them that way, you get the Pythagorean identities. So the first Pythagorean identity is cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1. That corresponds to this first theorem. The second is cotan squared theta plus 1 equals cosecant squared theta. That's the second equation, and 1 plus tan squared theta equals secant squared theta is the third equation. And, and you only need one of these, because if you just start with cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1, and, for example, you divide each term by cosine squared of theta, you will get the third equation, 1 plus tan squared theta equals secant squared theta. Number five, the angle sum formulas for the sine and the cosine. So this, the formula for sine of a plus b and cosine of a plus b. I'm not asking you to memorize the formula for tangent of a plus b. Sine of a plus b is sine a cosine b plus cosine a sine b. Cosine of a plus b is cosine a cosine b minus sine a sine b. There's a poem that a student once taught me that is a very nice way to help you remember how this works. It goes like this. Sine, cosine, cosine, sine, 
cosine, cosine, sine, sine, sine. Okay, I'll recite that again. Sine, cosine, cosine, sine, cosine, cosine, sine, sine, sine. Okay, notice that the S-I-G-N corresponds to the minus sign. So I hope that helps you remember it. There are a couple of corollaries to this, this theorem that you need to remember. First of all, the, the angle difference formula isn't really a separate formula. Uh, just remember that a minus b is a plus negative b, and then you have to remember how to compute the sine of negative b and the cosine of negative b, and that's based on the fact that the sine function is odd and the cosine function is even, which, if we get to point 6, the graphs, then you'll, you'll understand how to remember that. Uh, the other corollary, corollary is the double angle formula. Uh, if you need to find the sine of 2a, just remember 2a can be written as a plus a, and then you'll get two double angle formulas. Okay, number six. The graphs of the six trigonometric functions and the graphs of their inverses. Okay. Now before I draw uh, pictures of the graphs of the six trig functions, uh, I want to make sure that everyone has seen this really nifty construction of the sine function. Now you see a point moving around the unit circle. Okay, that point defines an angle and the angle is indicated by the shaded sector and the shaded arc length. And that arc length could be plotted on the x-axis, so that in, in uh, units of tau, uh, when we get to half tau, we're halfway around the circle, and when we get all the way around the circle, you're at an angle of tau radians. So that's how the x-axis is marked off. Now the y-coordinate of the point on the circle is the definition of the sine function. So I'm going to plot the y-coordinate, and to get the sine function curve, I just have to look at the locus of that point. So that's a visualization of what the sine function really means. All right, the full sine function graph looks like this, and you should be able to relate the four quadrants around the unit circle to the position on the x-axis. So from 0 to 1 fourth tau, or 90 degrees, we're in the fourth, or first quadrant. From 1 fourth tau to 1 half tau, we're in the second quadrant. From 1 half tau to 3 fourths tau, we're in the third quadrant. And from 3 fourths tau to tau, we're in the fourth quadrant. So you should be able to visualize, for example, that you're in the first quadrant, the sine function starts at 0 and goes up to 1. Whereas the cosine function, which is the x-coordinate, picture the x-coordinate on a unit circle, it starts at 1, and at the end of the first quadrant it has gone down to 0. So this is a quick way of remembering what the graph of the sine and the cosine functions look like. Now the tangent function, the graph of the tangent function has a period of 1 half tau instead of a period of tau. It looks something like this. It kind of lines up with the sine curve near the origin. The cotangent function is going to have the same shape, but instead of going up, it's going to go downward. So let me clear the tangent function curve, and here is a picture of the cotangent function. Now to remember the graph of the secant function, uh, remember that the, the secant is the reciprocal of the cosine. So when y is 1 or negative 1, then the value of the secant will match the value of the cosine. And then when you take 1 over a small number, you get a large number. So all of the values of the secant function are going to be values outside of that interval from negative 1 to 1. Uh, and the cosecant will have the same relationship with the sine function, since cosecant is 1 over sine. So now I have graphed the six trig functions. You should be able to sketch those graphs. Uh, now let's look at the six inverse trig functions. Now trig functions really don't have an inverse. Look at the sine function. It doesn't pass the horizontal line test. So there's no inverse of the sine function that passes the vertical line test. So we have to restrict the domain to a region like negative tau over 4 to tau over 4 so that the curve passes the horizontal line test. And then when we invert this 
part of the curve, then we have a graph of a function that we call the uh, inverse sine function. It's really an inverse of a domain restricted sine function. So I've formed this graph by reflecting the sine curve just in that domain across y equals x, or that's its equivalent to swapping x and y. So notice that the domain then goes from uh, x equals negative 1 to positive 1. The range is from negative tau over 4 to positive tau over 4. Now let's go to the cosine function. It also needs to restrict the domain, but not the same values. We need to restrict the domain to the interval from 0 to tau over 2. We take that region and we reflect that curve over the line y equals x, and we get the graph of the inverse cosine function. Its domain is still negative 1 to 1, but now its range is 0 to tau over 2, and that's the inverse cosine function. The inverse tangent function, we restrict the domain to the interval from negative tau over 4 to positive tau over 4. And then we get the reflection across the line y equals x, and we get a function that has a horizontal asymptote instead of a vertical asymptote. So the domain of the inverse tangent or arctangent function is all real numbers. The range is everything from negative tau over 4 to tau over 4. And as x gets larger and larger, the y value gets closer and closer to tau over 4. Now the inverse cotangent function has the same shape but backwards. If we restrict the domain to the interval from 0 to tau over 2 and reflect that, we get a function that has an asymptote of 0 on the right and tau over 2 on the left. And it passes through 0 at the y value of 1 quarter tau. The secant function needs to have its domain restricted to the interval from 0 to tau over 2. This curve passes the horizontal line test. When we reflect it along y equals x, across y equals x, we get this strange function whose domain excludes the interval from negative 1 to 1. It has one single asymptote, both on the left and the right. That asymptote is y equals tau over 4. And then lastly, the cosecant function has to have its domain restricted to negative tau over 4 to tau over 4. We take this part of the curve and we reflect that across y equals x and we get uh, this function. That's the graph of the inverse cosecant function. So these are the six inverse trig functions and if you graph them all together at the same time then you get a kind of pretty looking picture.